My name is Brennan Smith. I'm a graduate assistant here with Health and Wellness, and we're going to be talking about reading food labels and simplifying them. The goal with this presentation is to help you guys become better consumers, more empowered, and more informed. Because a lot of times I know that when you get to the grocery store, it's kind of an anxiety producing moment when you see so many options and you don't know what to do. So we're gonna try and lessen that anxiety by empowering you with information. We're gonna introduce the new food label. It's been 20 years since the old one was created, so I think it's time to update it. We're gonna address key label elements and identify common food traps, label traps. So a disclaimer, all processed food is not necessarily evil. I think there's a lot of um, buzz in the media saying processed food is bad, you should eat raw foods. But if you're buying something that is out of its natural form, it's gonna be processed in some way, no matter if it's labeled to be organic or raw or whatever, if it's in a package, it's processed. So you really have to just define what you want to look for in your foods um, and think about what your calorie needs are and your food needs are. So just a reminder, not all food processed food is bad. So here's the new food label. So as you can see, this part is a little bit bigger. The calories per serving are larger, so it's easier to see because it's a little bit small. Um, the serving size is also bigger. They added some things here, subtracted some things here, which I will go over, um, and they also changed the nutrient facts on the bottom. But overall, it's got the same, a lot of the same general ideas, just looks a little bit different. Everyone is going to be required to have this label by July of 2018, but I personally have seen the new one in some food now. Um, so just keep an eye out for it. So let's go over the first part. So the first part is the serving size here, the calories. They now have changed the serving size to be more realistic because um, Actually, serving sizes on a label reflect what people are actually eating in the population based on surveys, not what you should be eating, which was interesting to me. I didn't know that before. Um, but it actually reflects the general population serving size. Um, then also, packages thought of the single serving, such as soups or sodas. Um, a lot of sodas that are from like machines or whatever are actually double servings, but people tend to just drink the whole thing. So now the labels ref will reflect that um, instead of just assuming you'll break it up, because you probably won't. Um, also, some of the foods will provide per package, so they will include serving sizes. And I just wanted to reiterate the difference between serving size and portion size. So like I said, serving sizes on the label are reflected by what people are eating in the population, but it doesn't necessarily mean that is, that is the portion size you should be eating. Um, so just keep an eye on reminding yourself what your calorie needs are, because you might necessar not necessarily need a whole cup of ice cream or two thirds a cup of ice cream. So just keep an eye, that's what the nice thing about this is that it's larger and more accurate so you're more informed with your choices when you're eating. Likewise, in this middle portion here, they still include total fats. Um, they include trans fats, saturated fats. Ideally, you're going to be looking for zero grams of trans fat and you have to be careful because legally on the packaging, they're not required to report it if there is less than 0.5 grams of trans fats in the foods. So even though it says there's zero, trans, zero grams of trans fat, there may be trans fat in there. And a key to looking for if there is trans fats is looking to see if there's partially hydrogenated oils in it. Um, usually products that have trans fats are uh, margarine, bakery and snack foods, and chips and crackers but just really look for the partially hydrogenated oils. And it's easy to make a decision to kind of cut those trans fats out because there's so many options in the grocery stores now that you can just pick and choose. I just wanna address the dangers of trans fats because I know it's gotten a lot of publicity 
as of late, but um, trans fats are shown in the research to lower HDL cholesterol, which is the healthy and good cholesterol for you, um, raises your LDL cholesterol, which is the bad cholesterol for you. It increases the risk of heart disease and stroke. Um, it increases your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. It increases inflammation, which is correlated with heart disease, um, and it contributes to insulin resistance. And an interesting fact that a Harvard study came up with was for every 2% of calories from trans fats consumed daily, your um, risk of cardiovascular heart disease increases by 23%. So it's kind of a, a big fact that they found it at Harvard. So that just kind of tells you that you want to be super aware of the trans fats that you're eating. Um, so instead of trans fats, it's good to make a choice to choose sat unsaturated fats instead of trans fats in saturated fats. And you can find those in um, seeds, nuts, avocados, fatty fish like salmon, um, and olive and canola oils. So just knowing that you wanna choose these is probably a good choice instead of your partially hydrogenated oils on the label. Um, and then also, a study from the CDC is that the type of fat matters more than the amount of fat that you're consuming. Of course, take that with a grain of salt because at some point the amount of fat that you're eating is going to make a difference because fat is definitely more calorie dense than carbs or proteins. So if you're eating a bunch of fats throughout the day, your calorie intake is probably going to increase. But definitely be aware of your type of fat which we go back to the trans fat and unsaturated fats. Sodium is also included on this label still. Um, 2,300 milligrams a day is the recommended amount to eat. Um, interestingly, the average sodium consumption by Americans now is 3,400 milligrams, which if you do the math, it's a little greater than the recommended daily amount. So being aware of how many milligrams of sodium are in your serving sizes, is gonna be a key factor in keeping that sodium level down. Um, and definitely keeping in mind that this average consumption is so high, if your doctor or whatever is telling you to do a low sodium diet, but you're up here, focus on going to 2,300 milligrams because this average consumption is so high, go for the recommended and then you can go, once you get used to that, go down to your recommended low sodium in input. And it's, in, it's really cool now because the manufacturers that are producing these foods are aware of this increased sodium intake. So they're giving you options for low sodium, no sodium added. So it's easy, again, to look at the different brands and look at the different foods that are in the grocery stores because you have options for low sodium. Um, so it's kind of a nice thing that they're helping us out with. Carbs, obviously, are added. With the carbohydrate intake, you want to make sure you're getting more dietary fiber than sugars, and that comes into added sugars. Um, with dietary fiber, you wanna look for whole grains as the first ingredient. A lot of foods add fiber um, minimally through some added processing ingredients, but you definitely wanna look for whole grains. A really cool thing with this new label is that they're, add, they're including added sugars. So added sugars are basically sugars added during processing to either help with longevity or increased taste, but it doesn't include, so it doesn't include the sugars that are naturally included in foods. Um, so the recommended daily amounts for women are 24 grams a day of added sugar, 36 grams a day for men, and this makes it so much easier to be able to count those grams throughout the day so you don't have to worry about it. Because on the old one, they didn't even include it. So you just kind of had to. So her question was, the line at the bottom is just the added sugars. And yes, it is. The total sugars is right above it. And then the added sugar is right below it on the label. It would just be that added sugars. Exactly. Yep. So the 24 grams a day would just be the added sugars. 
Um, and you can definitely on the next slide, I'll address some of the added sugars that are included in foods, but it definitely can come from a lot of unexpected sources. So protein bars, for an example, like um, Cliff bars have a lot of sugar, added sugar in them. Even though you think that you're doing well, you're like, I'm gonna grab a bar because I'm feeling healthy today because it has like 12 grams of protein, but it has like 30 grams of sugar in it. So being aware of the added sugars is a key thing. You can find added sugar in condiments a lot of times, sauces, yogurt, um, a lot of cereals actually have a lot of added sugar. So just being, again, being aware, your goal is to get 100% whole grains here, but a lot of times on labels, they'll uh, give some whole grains, some fake whole grains, which include wheat flour, cracked wheat, enriched flour, stone ground, multigrain, and made with wheat flour or dot, dot, dot on the list. But you really want to look for this whole, whatever grain type it is, the brown and wild rice, oats, quinoa, amaranth, and bulgur. And a good test to see if there's actually whole grains in your food is if there's more than three grams of fiber in it. So if there's any less than three grams of fiber in your food, it's most likely not a real whole grain. So again, look at your labels. Three grams of fiber is the uh, lowest common denominator there. So added sugars. Again, this is a really cool infographic here to just address how many added sugars are out there. Even though they might sound healthy, like as you can see, high fructose corn syrup is a buzzword, corn syrup in general, um, mannitol, fructose, you can read, even fruit juice, that sounds super healthy, right? Like in fruit snacks sometimes, it's like included real fruit juice, but it's still added sugars. So just be aware. It's not like you can, can't eat that. You can eat fruit snack. Just be aware. The question was about sugar alcohols, um, and they are typically seen in, you know, what you call diabetic friendly foods, right? That say, you know, reduced carb and low sugar and, you know, things like that. Um, now they do still raise blood sugar slightly. So they are not the same as what we're calling artificial sweeteners that Brennan is going to look at with you in just a minute. Um, but sugar alcohols will still raise your blood sugar a little bit, but they contribute about half of the carbohydrates that regular sugars do. Um, so that's why they're used um, in a lot of those diabetic products, but typically have better properties in terms of food manufacturing. So that's often why they they get used. Yeah. But typically, like the gentleman said, right, anything that ends in OL is going to be what, what's a sugar alcohol. Okay. So as we're talking about artificial sweeteners, like we're talking about, a lot of foods do have artificial sweeteners added. As we said, those natural um, protein bars or nutrition bars. Um, like we said, the sugar alcohols could be one of them. And then also these are some of the common names uh, you'll see on the, on the labels of the foods that you're looking at. Sucralose, um, saccharin, aspartame, asulfame, potassium. Sometimes you'll see it as ACE-K, stevia. Um, monk fruit extract is one. And then like we're saying, the sugar alcohols. Pretty much anything that ends in OL is going to be a sugar alcohol. That's the short list of our artificial sweeteners. Okay, so moving on to the vitamins and minerals, we're actually changing up what's on the label. It used to be included that um, vitamins A and C were on the label, but it was found that vitamin A and C deficiencies are pretty minimal now. We're getting a pretty good intake of vitamins A and C. So they addressed the ones that are actually deficient, which is vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. So vitamin D is really important with your body. It promotes calcium absorption in the gut and maintains adequate serum calcium. Calcium is super important. I'll address that in a second. It is needed for bone growth and remodeling of bones. It protects from osteoporosis in combination with calcium. Um, it helps with cell growth. It helps with neuromuscular function. Um, reduction of, of inflammation. And so, as you can see, it's super important and a lot of us are deficient in it. Um, but you can get them from some fatty fishes like salmon and tuna, from cheese, 
from egg yolks and definitely fortified milk. You can see a lot of times on labels, it'll say fortified with vitamin D and calcium. So just keep an eye on, on that. Um, potassium, another one, potassium maintains electrolyte and fluid balance in your body. Um, it helps with organ function and muscle function. Um, actually with muscle contraction, potassium is a huge part of um, maintaining muscle contraction, not only in the skeletal muscle, but in your heart muscle. Um, it helps with the sodium potassium pump, which helps the cells um, bring different concentration of um, molecules in and out of the cells, just helps with balance there. And sources of that, obviously bananas, but avocado has a ton of potassium in it, leafy greens, sweet potato, salmon, so pretty much salmon's awesome, and pomegranate. So you can kind of mix up your potassium intake, not just eating a bunch of bananas. With calcium, goes hand in hand with vitamin D. Again, put calcium is a huge part of muscle contraction as well. Um, it helps with vascular contraction and vasodilation, um, basically opening up those those blood vessels, contracting them. Um, it helps with muscle contraction, nerve transmission, huge, it's a huge part of, mus of ner nerve transmission. Helps with intracellular signal signaling and hormone balances and secretions. And it basically supports the function and uh, structure of bones, which we pretty much knew already. Um, um, obviously like dairy products, like yogurt, milk, cheese, Kale has a lot of calcium and broccoli has a lot of calcium. So you can find really awesome recipes with kale and broccoli. We had a cooking class on Monday and we made broccoli nachos and it was the best thing I've ever had in my life. And if you wanna know more about that, talk to Karen because there's definitely recipes, really great. And it has cheese on it. So you're basically getting a bunch of calcium and vitamin D, it's great. Iron, also, we all know that's kind of a deficiency that's in the public now. It helps maintain hemoglobin and myoglobin, which transfers oxygen to the, the blood um, and from the, not from blood, because it's in blood, lungs into the tissues and also from the circulation to muscles. Super important. And it helps with growth and development and normal functioning of the cells. So you want your cells to be healthy definitely get your iron in. You can find iron in lean meat, seafood, nuts, beans, vegetables, and fortified grains. Um, you can get your whole grains in with your iron intake. With food additives, I just want to address food, add food additives because obviously when you're getting food, if it's in a package, it's been processed somewhat. So if you want to know what exactly is on that label, so towards the end, if it's a really long label, you'll start to see words that you don't know what they are. They, send, they, they sound real chemical-y. Um, this chemical cu cuisine index from the Center for Science in the Public Interest, CSPI, there's a link if you wanna look at it. It basically addresses the safety information for the common food additives. So it flags these additives as safe or unsafe or unknown. It's basically like a color code. So it's a really cool resource to see what exactly these food additives are and what, where they came from and what they do in the foods. Um, but basically the bottom line, the point of this, why this exists on the internet in life is to make you aware that the shorter the ingredient list at the bottom of the food label, the probably the better it is. The more words you don't understand, the longer the list is probably not as good for you. And again, you just make that choice where you're comparing food labels across products because you have options and see, okay, this one has like 20 ingredients and this one has 10. Let's go with the 10 one. Package claims on food boxes are also a big trap. So we're going to address the kind of food traps, food label traps that some of these products can kind of trap you into. So I just want to bring awareness to the fact that some people make a bunch of money making these labels, making these pictures on the, on the foods to kind of suck you in and make you think that it's healthy. 
and trap you into making these food choices just to keep that in mind they're getting paid for that so having more knowledge about the information on the food label is going to help you make a better decision so really don't pay attention to this box like the boxes really look at the food labels themselves and see what's actually in the boxes so trap one we're distracting you with flashy claims so these two pictures are interesting interesting to me um, a lot of foods claim that they're high in calcium or high in protein rich in whatever they want to say excellent source of more fortified and rich fat free low fat light you just want to keep in mind does this claim actually make the food healthy and as you can see you can make claims on foods that aren't necessarily healthy, such as Oreos and candy bars. So just because it says it's sugar-free or 45% less fat than other candy bars doesn't mean that it's nutrient-dense um, or necessarily good for you. Um, so kind of seeing what it's being compared to and seeing what the actual food consists of is gonna help you a lot with those claims. <clears throat> Trap two make sure you're not creating a health halo. So basically what the term health halo means is that the manufacturers are using spark words to almost trick you into thinking that the food is healthier than it actually is, or the thought that one grocery store is healthier than the other. So such, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the foods they have there are any better than the ones at Kroger. And that's where the information about the food labels comes into play. Like if I go to Lucky's and get gummy bears, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily better ingredients and better for you than if I get gummy bears from Kroger. They're still gummy bears. So just because it's from Lucky's doesn't make it healthy. Um, they rely on those, these tricks. So looking at the added nutrients doesn't necessarily make it a nutritionally dense food. Like I was saying about the fiber, it could be through um, those fake grains that you're getting the added fiber. And again, looking at the three grams of fiber to make sure it's whole grain. And a really cool example is this Cheerios protein. You wanna make sure that you're looking at getting whole nutrients. That yes, it has like seven grams of protein, but it also has 32 grams of sugars in it. So is it really that nutritional? like smart nutrition choice to choose, like I'm getting my protein from the cereal when I could really have some yogurt maybe and add, maybe sprinkle some Cheerios on top um, or maybe some granola and get more protein and more whole foods. Um, so making that choice definitely for you for to get your nutrient needs, but also making a smart choice with the balance of nutrients. So just the key, Get your, whole, your nutrients from whole foods, um, fruits, vegetables, legumes, fatty fish, lean meats, whole grains, and unsaturated fats. That's key. Don't get trapped and tricked into getting your nutrient consumption from something that may be added, but not beneficial overall. So the bottom line, as I've kind of addressed throughout this presentation, is to bring awareness and um, knowledge to the food label it gives you a little more control over what decisions you're making and gives you less anxiety with what foods you're choosing so again use your common sense keep in mind your own nutritional and food goals and um, analyze those labels and see if it's worth it and if it's too if it sounds too good to be true it most likely is because again those people are paid to make those claims and uh, make those pretty boxes. So use your knowledge, use your brain. Again, look for the shorter ingredient lists and um, just make your priorities and stick to them. Maybe write them down. It's easier if you write them down um, and make those informed decisions. The food grade sweetener that is used, right, in any commercial foods or drinks is different than what you would naturally just straight up extract from the stevia plant. 
Um, so you can, at sure, any kind of you know co-op or health food store, buy like a stevia plant extract or tincture, right, that you could use. But again, what is used in the food supply and has been approved by the FDA as a food additive has actually undergone quite a bit more processing and is now deemed a food additive. Does that make sense? Yeah, good question. So the question was about diabetics, if we're just looking at added sugars or we're looking at carbs and added sugars, was that kind of the gist of it? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, right, that, that is an excellent question. Both matter, both matter, right? Um, added sugars really is a subset of total carbohydrates, okay? So you wanna look at total carbohydrates as your kind of big umbrella, right? Kind of like we saw on the label, it does list total carbs, then it lists sugars, and then it lists added sugars. So that's how you want to view it, right? Um, but added sugars certainly is compared to more complex carbs, such as those whole grains Brennan was talking about. Added sugars will typically spike your blood sugar a little bit more quickly and a little bit more intensely, right? As opposed to those high fiber whole grains or your fruits and vegetables, it's, it's not going to have quite as a dramatic effect, right, on your blood sugar. So in terms of, you know, within the day management, that's one thing to think about. <laughs> but we also know that just the total carbohydrate load on your body throughout the day does matter with diabetes management as well. Does that help? Yeah. And certainly, I want to remind you guys too, right? I mean, we do offer free consultations with myself and Vanessa Oliver, our other dietitian. So if there's certainly something, you know, with that kind of health concern or anything else, you know, personally to you, we want to remind you, we offer that for free too. So the question was, when we're looking at the list of artificial sweeteners, which one do we determine is the least processed and the most natural? One way to answer that, it, it, it wouldn't be so much in terms of how natural is it, but what is its safety rating, okay? Mm -hmm. And so that is how I would look at that concern. And you can actually find that information by going to the link Brennan had talked about, the Center for Science and the Public Interest, that CSPI. But the CSPI link, right, for that chemical cuisine will include all of these, again, FDA-approved artificial sweeteners, and you can see what safety rating CSPI has given them, because it does give them different ones. I can tell you right off the bat that they have given monk fruit um, and stevia and sugar alcohols um, probably the highest ratings in terms of safety. Um, sucralose is kind of like a caution, like a yellow light. And the saccharin, aspartame, and sulfate, potassium, I believe are the lowest ranked, okay? So just as a very general overview, that's how it tends to break down. But really that's the only thing I could even give you that's evidence-based, right? To make that decision of which artificial sweeteners to gravitate towards. So the comment was, um, it's interesting to look at comparing the the foods that say low fat to their original product that they're being compared to and seeing what they're taking out, but also what they're replacing, whatever they're quote, taking out with. So a lot of times with low fat, they're reducing the fat, but they may increase the, the sugar amount. Um, so we were saying that it's easier sometimes to choose the maybe low fat, low sugar options and then creating the food that we want ourselves. So the example was with Greek yogurt, um, we wanna look at the lower fat option, lower sugar option, and then maybe add some granola to it and it tastes just like a Rocky Road ice cream. So the question was, will people feel more justified to overeat because the serving sizes are now increased to reflect the population increase in intake? The logical answer I feel like would be yes, potentially, just because people don't know what the serving size actually means. Like I didn't know that it was um, actually a reflection on the population intake until I started researching this subject. And so I think that's where it comes in, the importance of understanding what the label means and understanding portion sizes too. Do you have anything yeah, to add? Yeah. Okay, I perfect. Mean, we my, my guess too is that, um, <clears throat> whatever people probably are currently eating in terms of their portion sizes, that even adjusted serving size on the label will probably for a lot of us with a lot of food still be less yes. than what we are currently consuming, right? Um, so I don't think anything I've seen so far of these suggested serving sizes on the new label are so out of line that, you know, they are still going to lead to, you know, if you're following those, you know, 
too much calorie consumption, but I think a lot of us would be doing well just to start match, you know, start matching our consumption with maybe more of what those new serving sizes are. Mm -hmm. We can utilize those free services from Karen and Vanessa, and I believe that using online resources like um, my plate, I think it's called Super Tracker now, or my yeah. Fitness Pal is a really good thing mm -hmm. um, to kind of suggest those intake percentages with your macronutrients um, and yeah, no, Brenda's right. I mean, I think, you know, some kind of food tracking app or program would be a good place to start. Mm -hmm. um, Super Tracker, like Brenda said, is going to be based on my plate. Um, and so it's going to be a very, you know, well-balanced, moderate type of um, meal plan to follow mm -hmm. and ensure you're getting all your food groups and show you what is a serving of fruit, what is a serving of meat. That is what my plate and Super Tracker um, are there to do. So yeah, I would say that's a really great idea mm -hmm. if you're just looking to, to get started.